if you get into a debate about this issue with, say, an ardent and very devout member of the Roman Catholic Church, you will, they will probably not win the argument in an intellectual sense. If, if you say, how does prayer actually work? Are there a radio wave going from your brain to God that they have been discovered and so on? They will not want to address that question. They will give you various anecdotal examples of how in the past, to their satisfaction, it has, it has worked. Now, for a long time, I found that frustrating. But then I realized that to them, the value of a total faith that was unquestioning and just accepting had a security and gave them a base of life that they found com comforting and, and a reasonable purpose. And therefore, when you get people who are passionately against abortion because they believe that life is sacred from the moment of conception, it's difficult for them to defend that, but that very belief makes their own life for the time being just slightly better than it otherwise be. And therefore, winning the argument, as on that broadcast, on that film, you certainly did, may not actually improve their lives in the long run. That's such a fascinating question, and you're absolutely right. Um, I think my issue, as with many of these other hot button subjects like equal marriage and so on, is not so much that I want those people to change their minds is I want them to stop messing with other people's rights so that they, of course, can hold with complete integrity what they believe. It's the controlling of other people on behalf of their beliefs that I find very difficult. Uh, well, I would agree with that and also say that actually I sort of disagree with your premise or their premise that a faith that is unquestioning to me is pretty juvenile faith. Uh, because uh, faith should be questioning, it should be railing against God, it should be saying, why is the world the way it is? It should be saying, how can we improve it? How can we change it? And uh, part of the religious quest is to change for the good, which you know we could describe as a messianic vision, that there is a better version of this world than what we already have, um, or you could just say we want to make things, uh, get things right. Um, so for me, uh, uh, being in favour of legalisation of assisted dying is a religious duty to try, uh, because I have questioned that people die in pain, in agony. Um, for me, there's nothing sacred about suffering, nothing holy about agony, uh, and therefore we need to change it, for religious reasons. Do you want to say something, Jeff? Um, I think I just want to um, make a point about... Can you speak into the mic? Oh, uh, is it? Sorry. <coughs> is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I, I think the implication about how the word belief is used um, is, is an interesting one. Um, belief for Muslims does not imply something that is unquestioning. And within Islam, um, true believers are called about called upon to know this question. And I think one of the points that my husband was making is about what what he called zombie Muslims, um, which they are, uh, uh, there's a certain strand of philosophy, certainly among the Sufis and the more mystical elements of Islam, which actually uh, denigrates believers who do not think and say they are not true believers. So within Islam, the idea that belief is unquestioning, from a philosophical point of view, cannot be true. That your belief can only be believed if you question. Okay, so that's a philosophical concept within Islam. Um, and the text that is used to highlight this is, is one of the um, surahs from the Quran, which says, if God had willed it, he would have willed all to believe. But he didn't. He gave you a choice to believe. So if you have a choice, you can only have a choice if you think and challenge and contemplate, and that is a, a thread that goes through the Quran all the time, and that's what my husband was alluding to um, as well. And so whether it's a, a topic of this is to die, or uh, equal marriages, or, or whatever, true Muslims, true believers, are called to think if they wish to be called true believers. And it's from that standpoint that my husband as a progressive Muslim comes. 
But that, I totally understand, is not what the orthodox um, majority of Muslims would say. And that's why this is a problem within the Muslim community. That debate cannot be started because most Muslims would be condemned for daring to question. I think what that film does show is that there, it, it, it busts the myth that there is a monolithic religious view. Thou shalt not. Uh, just as there are disagreements within the secular community, so there are differences of opinion, different perceptions within the religious community. Thank you. Anybody else like to say something? Please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, back, here. and then we'll come to you, and then. Um, I wonder if this is about sort of not just about sort of people who have a religion or don't. Uh, uh, because you said, well, 80% of uh, people who either have or don't have a religion are for assisted but dying. So it's not about sort of flocks, but it's about sort of the leaderships, right, the, um, whether it's religion, political or whatever, because perhaps they feel threatened by sort of a challenge to their authority, to their respect their control kind of thing. So, you know, that's natural. <laughs> so, maybe to try to get them uh, on board with us is to try to reassure, reassure them that, no, it doesn't mean to say, you know, you're going to lose all authority and respect as a religious person or political person or, or whatever. Because if you look at um, sort of challenges in the past, someone mentioned sort of access to uh, contraception and abortion. The world didn't fall apart <laughs> when those things were granted, and the respect and authority of religious and political leaders didn't fall, fall apart. And so the world is not going to be fall apart in that way if they actually sort of <laughs> those leaderships feel that assisted dying is maybe something for them to, uh, to consider and not oppose. And I think the other thing is that I think their uh, feel, feeling of threat is not just about uh, individuals and their choice, but it's about a threat to society as a whole. Will this mean to say that sort of values of what's good or respected or safe sort of fall apart? And so I think for, for me the issue of this time isn't just about individual choice. That is important, that's part of it. But in my opinion it's also about the whole good of society, that actually would be good for all of society if we had a choice to have a, a, a system death that was there. Okay, thank you. I'd love to answer that. Yes, I think you, you've opened up a really, really interesting um, area. First of all, you're right, certainly in the Christian context, that the leaders are very, very against this. Um, I know personally, I've had a handwritten letter from the Archbishop telling me off about it, and I'm the only acting... Church of England vicar at the moment who articulates this stuff. Fortunately, being on the naughty step with Desmond Tutu ain't that bad. <laughs> but what it signals is a huge shift in the way in which British society works. And the bishops still think they're in the 50s. And in the 50s and before then, they saw themselves as, as, as the moral guardians of the conscience of the country. They were the leaders. They would say to the country, this is what's right, this is the way we're going forward. That was the role they had, particularly in the House of Lords. And what they are discovering, and I think the ship has well sailed now, is that they are behind the curve in moral issues. So for the younger generation, the issues of equality and freedom and justice, and you know that's why the, the, the gay um, and, 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 and anti-women priests and all that kind of thing is so hot, all those issues are moral issues where the next generation is ahead of the curve and the bishops are behind the curve. And they say, oh dear, 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 they're not getting it right. Um, and what they fail to realise is that the world has changed and they're not, looking, they're not being looked at as, as grumpy old men. They're being looked at people who are failing on these moral areas. They should be taking the leadership. In fact, they're just holding the rest of the country back. And this is a huge shift, and I don't think we can ever put the toothpaste back in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the tube. I don't think the bishops will carry that moral weight anymore because of some of these big issues where they have had big moral fails. Thank you. Yes, and, and, and also I think it's actually 
not just on this issue, but it's part mm. of a mindset, and that as a generalisation, there wouldn't be exceptions. The same people against the assisted dying, or against abortion, or against female priests, or against gay gay marriage, is all part of the that we, we're against the whole thing uh, and the C word uh, change. Um, and uh, change has always been part of religious life. It's a religious dynamic. Um, and the other thing is, as you rightly said, uh, reassurance. Uh, because there are some people who are sympathetic but genuinely unsure, or a little bit worried, or wavering, or nervous. Um, and that's why talking about safeguards uh, is so important. Uh, it's certainly what helped change my mind. Um, and having um, the various safeguards, um, whether it's you know, you have to see two independent doctors, or there has to be judicial oversight, or goodness knows what they are, um, but those are very important. So that we say, look, these are concrete things. Um, and the, all the arguments about slippery slope uh, can't happen, won't happen. Um, and, uh, and as I said in the film, we, we, you know, we've actually got good evidence from, from Oregon. Um, and that by and large, the people are, who apply for assisted dying are not sort of vulnerable, impoverished people whose children want to get hands on the loot. Um, they are people who have been used to making uh, decisions throughout their life, have been used to autonomy, who are in the sort of AB bracket, socioeconomic bracket, and who want to make the same decision about their death that they've made about the last 60, 70 years. Um, I'm, I'm going to say something very brief about leadership in Islam, and then if, if, you, want, if you would like to um, ask more, I'm more than happy to have a look. Within the Islamic tradition, there is no, I, there is no idea of clergy. There is not supposed to be a hierarchical structure of clergy within Islam. Nothing in the Quran says that there is supposed to be an imam who tells you what to do. The imam is simply the prayer leader, as my husband is. He simply leads the prayers because that is the person that the congregation has selected. He, he is not appointed by a pope or by a bishop. There is no cler clerical hierarchy within Islam. What we, what we do have is we have self-appointed leaders who have set themselves up as imams or sheikhs or whatever the title is that they use. Um, and they have been set up and they have self-appointed self-appointed themselves and then they have been allowed to remain self-appointed by the communities that have called them to take some kind of leadership position. So it's very different from certainly from the Christian tradition. The closest maybe that you can come is within the Shia tradition where there is a scholarly hierarchy of as the Ayatollahs move up. But these this is a scholarly hierarchy, not a inherently religious hierarchy. So if you wanted to unpick it more about why there is this lack of debate that is closed down by self-appointed leaders within the Muslim community, we can unpick it a bit more. But there is no bishops or archbishops or anything. I, I think maybe the one thing that you might want to pick up from this is that these um, self-appointed leaders issue fatwas, which is the equivalent of being put on the naughty step, which carry unfortunately carry authority within the communities. And some of these fatwas can be extremely um, dangerous. Um, but there is no clerical, supposedly there should be no clerical hierarchy. Uh, and what, what is common, I think all three phase, is a peculiar religious disease called right shoulder itis. Uh, in that everybody, or religious leaders, tend to look over their shoulder to the, to the right of them. And the most more extreme, rather than the other way around. Uh, like is, Theresa May, you mean? Huh? Like Theresa May, you mean? No. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add one thing. I, I, I know I was there, but in looking back at the film, the thing that got me was there was continual talk about the disconnect between the leaders and the, the people in the pews, for want of a better phrase. Uh, and I think it's important that we all realise that um, you know, we here are the people in the pews. So, you, you know, you've just got to have a go at the leaders and keep on pushing. Uh, there was one more question. I'm sorry, Colin, that I've told we're out of time. There's one question here, and I'll hand you my microphone. It's a very simple and straightforward question, actually, which is really just to say how do those of us who do not have a God, you know, 
no God-related religion. Best stay in dialogue with you who do refer at least some of your decision-making, or at least look for guidance, something above you. How do we best stay in dialogue with you in respecting where you're coming from, and how do you best stay in dialogue with us where we're coming from? And, and just as a rider to that, and how do we bring in the um, non monotheistic religions into that as well? I don't think we've got time for a very long answer, but I would just like to say that. Um, Every human being, everyone sitting in this room, has within them um, a moral framework and then chooses a language with which to articulate it. And some of us choose a religious language, and other people choose a humanist language or uh, a, a different sort of language, a different religious language. But actually, the essence of being a human being, we have in common. So there's so much more that unites us than divides us. And it's, again, when we start using our language to control people who don't use our language that you start getting into trouble. Thank you. Yes, and, and I think we've actually got a lot of experience of working together. I mean, there's a constant series of alliances, aren't there, sort of on whether it's on green issues or on gay rights issues. So um, we've been able to do that on a variety of causes, and uh, why not this one? Uh, I, I just say it's important for you that by all means attack the religious hierarchy uh, or rather, uh, feel free to attack the conservative religion, but re re remember that there is a liberal religion and uh, religious <laughs> leaders uh, who are very much fighting on the same uh, battle. So it's not against, it's not, it's not the battle isn't secular versus religion. It's, um, it's uh, we're on the, many of us are on the same side, and it crosses the uh, faith divide. Uh, so, so I'll be brief, and, and, and I'm, I'm certainly going to um, echo what both of those views. So. Um, and I'm going to quote probably exactly what my husband would have probably have said today because he quotes this all the time. So um, the gentleman who asked the question, what's your name? Me, yeah. Stephen. Stephen. Well, well, Stephen, you'd be interested to know that my husband would call you a Muslim with a small M. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. To be, a, to be a Muslim with a small M, you just need to do three things. You need to be believe in something. Okay, and that's your moral framework, whatever it is. Muslims with a big M believing. God and they, you know, practice their faith in that way. But you, have, you need to have a belief system, right? That is not to do with your own self-interest. You need to do good for humanity around you. That's what Muslims are called to do. And there is a sense of accountability. You can't knock up the planet and expect there not to be um, a comeback from that. So Muslims, of course, as you heard my husband say, Muslims are big and believe in a day of judgment and that they will be accountable to God. But so you are actually a Muslim with a small man because you have a moral framework, you do good, and you have a sense of being accountable for your actions. And therefore, as a Muslim with a small man, my husband would say, you need to do what a Muslim should be doing, which is challenge the orthodoxy. And so my advice, and certainly even as a Unitarian, is don't believe that if a self-appointed Muslim leader says, we are against this, don't believe them because they are self-appointed and they do not speak for the root and branch who, who is basically being kept quite silent. So don't simply, and I think this is the, the problem with, with being the host country with a religion that comes in from the outside, is that the taxi driver tells you this is Islam and because you are not Muslim, you believe what the taxi driver tells you. <laughs> okay, so, so, so I'm a doctor. And if I, if, if I wanted to go to hear something about medicine, I would not go to the taxi driver. <laughs> I would go find out for myself. And we are all thinking, we all have the ability to think and to question and to challenge. So, see the difference. <laughs> well, I'm very sorry. We, we've run out of time for this bit. I hope you all enjoyed the film. Sorry, it's um, Uh, well, first of all, can I just say that anyone who has a friend attack, please don't feel awkward about leaving it. We have slightly overrun. Um, but those who would like to stay, if, if the panel have time, I, are you um, one more question? Uh, Jonathan, are you okay to stay? Right, it will have to be one more question. Have you, have you got the microphone there? Uh, well done. Um, my, my question is about. Um, 
Um, I'm from a, a history background, and so I found the Yard of Egypt, and I think the reincarnation of our guide. And my question is about something like the fact that um, a self determined death is a chemical eruption, so you're kind of inducing your death if you're going to live in a house where, yeah. you know, people are to choose to stop giving your. And my question is about. Um, how does that stand? Um, how does that stand religiously? That if you do the reincarnation as a virus and spiritual type of, and you're then chemically inducing your own death, how does that affect one's karmic? Oh, well, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure that we have the experts here for that one. But it's nice to end with an easy question. <laughs> um, actually, I haven't got a clue. Um, <laughs> Uh, because for, for, certainly for me, for a Jew, we, um, we, we don't have that concept, and therefore we just never address the issue. Um, so I, um, it, it actually always amused me that, that uh, oh, never mind, it's a bit heretical, so never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid it's way out of my comfort zone. I wouldn't know what, I don't have the tools to begin to have a discussion about that. Oh, it's a fascinating question, I should go and read up about it. So what do you the end of the end? Yeah. You're going to have to ask a Hindu priest there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, but I'm sorry you, you got the all on that one. <laughs> so can I hand back to Phil and say thank you to uh, Rosie, to Jonathan and to Jackie for... Uh, <laughs>